Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to today's webinar, the first webinar of 2023 that we're doing here at DNA. And what more appropriate than 23 ways to market your campaign this year. And with Tim Martinez, my partner, COO, here joining us to go through the details. Tim, are you excited? I've never been more excited about anything in my entire life. That That's I expected nothing less. And we get a lot of questions about what to expect in 2023. How did things wrap up in 2022? When should I be marketing? What should I be doing? So I'm looking forward to going into all the details here today. I, of course, am on the monthly webinars. You probably know some of my background. I'll get into it briefly. But Tim, not sure everyone knows everything that you do and your rich history, even how we met and how I saw you speaking at conferences. Let, let's start there. Let's start with what you do, your story, and where your insights come from today. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure of everything that I do either. I just wake <laughs> up in the morning and I look at my calendar and my cell phone and I see what's the hottest fire that needs to be put out. Um, but yeah, I mean, my background is one of entrepreneurship. I always say I was the kid with the lemonade stand. That's my story. and I'm sticking to it. Truly had the lemonade stand, had a skate shop, uh, had an apparel company, sold mixtapes. I mean, anything I could do to make a buck. Uh, that's that's kind of my entrepreneurial roots. And then that, that grew to building larger businesses and then working with founders. And at some point, people started asking me for my advice. And I figured that was called consulting. So I bought a book on how to start a consulting business. And almost 20 years later, it just hadn't stopped. And I've been very active in the world of consulting, capital raising. I've worked with a lot of other consulting firms, investment banks, and I usually get the phone call when there's a complex problem that needs solutions. So if people say, what do you do? I say, I solve complex problems. Uh, and that could take a lot of forms and a lot of shapes. And sometimes one of those complex problems is I'm an early stage company looking to raise capital. I've never done this before. I'm unsure how to get into the game. How do I do this? And let's be honest, if you've been in the business as long as I've been in, that is more often than not the conversation. It's businesses always need to raise capital. And whether you're a startup or a mid-stage company and you're looking to double down, triple down, grow, needing capital is, it's, it's a truism in a business. So that's why I think DNA is so fantastic is that we've built a platform, an algorithm, an approach on how to help entrepreneurs and founders get over the hurdle of raising capital. So that's a little bit of my background and how we got to where we are. As far as DNA is concerned, um, I'm the wind beneath Jason Fishman's sales and whatever he needs, uh, I try to be there to support him in that process. Well, thank you for reading that part to script. I appreciate <laughs> just, uh, just can always, uh, you know, can't say enough nice things about Tim and everything that he does. I was going to throw the the theme from Rocky song on right before, uh, but uh, you know, understates it. Probably won't want to tell. Probably won't me, won't want me to tell you how many years he's been doing this for. Uh, but I've seen a you know a measurable impact on countless companies through uh, DNA here. And as I'm pulling up our deck uh, for today's presentation, um, I like to point out what we've done here at DNA in the sense that we've worked with over 350 brands on their equity crowdfunding campaign, uh, campaigns that have collectively raised nine figures of capital, have worked with over 650 brands uh, as a whole. And that that's where the background comes from. That's why this matters. It's not just something we read in a book. We're working on 30 to 50 campaigns at a time. And this is this is real-time data. This is based on what we're seeing here in January, what we've had to shift in December, uh, what we had to shift in, in 2022 to get here. So you're you're hearing it directly from the horse's mouth. Is that the expression? Yeah, you're getting fair. it from the fire hose? I don't, I don't take offense to that. Horse's <laughs> mouth. <I> don't <laughs> My screen's freezing up on this document here. Okay. And then it caught up on page 12. So when we're talking about 2023, we have to start with where we came from. And 
2021 record year for equity crowdfunding. 2022 saw some shifts. There were some things that happened in terms of current events. We started getting conversations from founders in February of, hey, should I hold off on my campaign until th this war in the Ukraine slows down? Uh, those conversations became more prevalent in April. And later in the year, it was cryptocurrency crashing first with Terra and the DeFi ecosystem and having effects on platforms like Voyager and later FTX and later other platforms to follow. Uh, there, there's question marks on real estate and how high it's gone, potential bubbles. This isn't even to speak about interest rates and mortgages and fears around that and, and why it's implemented to potentially have an impact on inflation and what that means. And it's hard to keep track of. As an investor, do I, do I deploy capital into a high-risk, high-return market, such as early-stage startups? Do, do I hold off? We, we've seen dips in the market, even just looking at the King's Crown metrics here, what occurred uh, in May, in June, in July, how it picked up uh, in, in later months, in the fall, in October, what that meant for the industry, what we saw continue from November, December, and some of the takeaways you know, what, one of the main things I want to point out is the top, the groups that are in the top positions, uh, we work with a you know good percentage of top 10 at any given moment, are the ones that are marketing and the ones that are figuring out how, how do I operate in this space, not if I should try to raise capital. My business needs it. I'm going to do it. H how do I go about it? Tim, that's a lot of information in a small period of time to, to encapsulate a year what were your perspectives on 2022 before we talk 2023? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right about 2021 being a banner year. And there was a lot of movement in 2022. And the bullet points there, the war in Ukraine, obviously the dips in uh, Bitcoin and FTX scandal, uh, sentiment across the board it did slow things down a bit. But, you know, we're marketers. And I fully agree that the top 10 campaigns had very robust marketing strategies. So we're not here and, and they there, you will always find successful businesses in up and down markets. People are just going to do the right things in the right sequence, regardless of market sentiment. And that's what we're here to talk about is what is that sequence of events? What can you do in a down market to ensure that you are giving yourself the best chance of success, regardless of the trending up or down, if there's a good offer, and the value is positioned properly, yes, market sentiment, investor sentiment could be down. But if the offer is good, then we need to break that message through regardless of the time. We always need to be pumping the message of your fantastic offer all the time, regardless of what's happening in the global economy. Couldn't agree more. Whether it's 2021, 2020, there's stimulus, there's extra money everywhere. People are spending, it's affecting economies in a positive way. Uh, whether this becomes the new normal and we're, we're operating at these levels or it dips down further in 2023, even if it, it takes more uh, tactics, you, you have to be looking at a strategy to get you to your results. No reason to shut down your company, pause, stop because of things that you can't control as much as how do you operate within? And that generally begins with, with strategy, uh, you know, looking at an encompassing plan, if nothing else, who you're targeting, what you're targeting them on and, and what you're targeting them with in terms of messaging, audience messaging, going into a funnel, how you're converting them, how you're closing them. Uh, we have a model called the eight point plan. I recommend you check out those webinars, articles. It's a thorough yet, yet concise way to approach the plan for your campaign. You look at competitors, you look at the audience, you look where to reach them. Tim, when you get asked this question, how do you approach it? Do, does advertising, that does paid media still work? Paid media absolutely still works. It is your lever. I think this is one of the strongest levers you can have uh, in marketing any campaign. And this is because you can control the lever. So for example, there's an endless amount of money you can spend on advertising. You can spend as much money as you would like to. How much do people spend on a Super Bowl ad, right? Millions and millions of dollars. 
So what we like with the digital advertising landscape is you can actually start with really low levels and scale those levels, which means you have a lot of control. If something is working, something's not working, a creative's working, you can test different things, a lot of flexibility versus let's say a lot of traditional media where you don't have as much flexibility. So you absolutely need to drive traffic to your campaign. Advertising is a way to get that done. And when you're doing it in a digital landscape, let's say Facebook, Instagram, and, and a lot of these social ad platforms and some search, we could talk about that more, but all the power is really at your fingertips. And you can double down when you start to see performance and triple down and quadruple down. And we've seen our clients double, triple, quadruple, 10x their spend because they're getting performance and getting results. It's the only reason they are scaling their spend. So advertising absolutely needs to be part of the strategy. And I don't know consistently what other channels you can use to, to produce this amount of traffic. I've seen articles hit. I've seen financial email newsletters and other types of mentions produce spikes in traffic. But again, in a sustainable fashion, we, we run advertising because it's the most performance-oriented channel, the most performance-oriented thing that we do in a consistent fashion that works for most brands, whether they're in planning, whether they're plateaued, whether they're in scaling stages when we speak with them. How else are you going to get a million impressions of your content to, to hopefully produce 10,000 clicks to, to you know, maybe get 200 uh, investors to, to get that first 200 K into your campaign and, and kick things off, you know, 50,000 visitors to your page to perhaps get a thousand investments, a million uh, in funding at a thousand dollar average investment value, which is, pretty standard on these reg CF campaigns, even if you're talking 2250, 2500 investment averages on a reg A plus campaign, you need a lot of traffic. So with advertising, you can buy that from specific audiences, drive them to your page with AB tests, variants of the messaging can have them go into landing pages, depending on the type of campaign variants there and optimize towards what's working best. We have the iOS update mentioned here that happened in late April, 2021. There was still a strong performance in 2021 throughout. What I find is many media buyers are, are not looking at all the analytics when they're saying, Hey, ads don't work as well. We don't know what's going on with the pixel. If we're able to spend $10,000 for a brand in a month, in a week, in a day for larger Reg A plus clients and see, you know, $50,000, $100,000 come back in return at those levels. We, we know there's something there. If we're able to scale it and run it at 20,000, again, insert time period and, and see twice the amount of results or close to it, there, there's something that we're able to continue to, to manage where if we're limiting it just to what we're seeing on the pixel, we could be shutting off a channel that has far more potential. There's other ways to track. If we're having a Facebook lead form as an example, and then matching a name, matching an email address, depending on the information you're getting from your portal or from your self-publishing platform uh, to an investment that occurs, we're able to have further attribution. If we're looking at how much traffic a pixel is showing us and the discrepancies for how much traffic Google Analytics or you know the page as a whole is showing us, we could look at those ratios and take the same projections towards investments. There's still ways to track it. Don't think by just not having the same readings from a pixel or only getting a third, a 10th of the data from the pixel that it's not working. I'm a big advertising guy because it is scalable almost systematically. If it's working at X, we could take it to you know, 2X and, and continue those type of multiples on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, uh, which is very difficult to do on other channels. Statistically though, Ads perform much better if content marketing is in place. What, what are your perspectives here towards content marketing, Tim? I, I know it's a, it's a big discussion we have internally all the time. Why do we do content marketing? Why, why should folks who are listening in be doing content marketing in 2023? Yeah, so in the context of a campaign, let's just think about the user journey. So 
you're at home and you're hanging out in the evening, scrolling on your phone on whatever social media platform you're on, and you see an ad, which is the first thing we talked about, and for whatever reason, it resonates with you because we're targeting you based upon a series of filters, your interests and things of that nature. And let's use a, a, a golf company, for example. You and I both play golf and we see uh, a golf ad and we say, hey, this is cool. I play golf and this is, sounds like an interesting startup. I, I'd love to be a, an early stage founder owner in this golf company. So most humans are going to inquire a bit further. You're not just going to click the button and make an investment right there. Chances are you're going to click the ad, read, watch a video, maybe sign up for a webinar, download something. You're going to take some kind of further action because we're not talking about uh, a flippant purchase like you would with, uh, I don't know, like a pair of shoes or something. You're, you're making an investment into an organization here. So chances are you're going to want to drill down. Now, this is an opportunity for the founding team to control the narrative. You get to determine what this user reads about your company. You actually get to control the entirety of the narrative here. So that that's a reason alone. You get to talk about your value proposition, why you're fantastic, why you're better than the competition, your intellectual property, the skills of your team and expertise. You get to talk about all this stuff and content. This is the place where you talk about that. That is content marketing. So think of your pitch deck, problem, sol uh, solution, target market, TAM, uh, financial projections, all, all of this information is content. So you have to extract all that content from your business plan, from your pitch deck, and then start turning it into digestible media for a series of different individuals that want to learn more about your content. So it helps up the trust factor because it's all about trust. And then they can confidently make an investment into your company. That's why you need the advertising and the content as a one-two punch. Statistically, ads perform better if content marketing is in place. The creation of good, engaging content that's that's physically designed for social shares, for high authority links, high authority coverage, leads to a higher conversion rate. So well, we'll get asked. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just interject on this real quick, which is run that same user journey. You click on the ad. You're like, hey, this is cool golf company. I want to invest. And you go yeah. visit the website and there's nothing. There's no information. You, you don't know anything but them asking for your money. It's like, <laughs> we're not going to give you any additional money, but please, uh, information, but please give us $1,000. It's <laughs> like, no, no, I, I think I'll keep my $1,000. But tell me more. Like, we're on a date. Dude, share more information. That's, you, that's what content marketing is. Absolutely. The internet to me is built on social proof. The more people telling you the more telling you the same information uh, online, the more you trust it. So you're seeing that from various sources. Uh, I, I see it on my own Forbes articles. If I get a few links or if I get 100 plus links, 100 plus people covering the article, even on a top site like Forbes, my tra traffic's drastically different. It could be 50 times uh, as different. So to be able to have that set up, have that funnel as you're talking about there, Tim, I mean, it's, it's seven touch points or more on, on most articles that you read. I've heard as many as... Uh, you know, 20 touch points or more before an audience converts. That's certainly true for investors. So when we get asked from founders, hey, what should we be doing? We heard how performance-oriented advertising is. What, why do we have to look at content marketing? Why do we have to spend on this type of thing? Uh, th th this is why we do it. Uh, publisher outreach of that content can take it further. Again, third-party validation, being able to show that social proof, being able to position you as a thought leader, as a founder, uh, with, with major media sites, blogs, social pages, social groups, some easier wins there, podcasts, <clears throat> any type of financial email newsletter that goes out to investors. It is a numbers game. There's a high volume here. Uh, that's generally required, even with relationships, but relationships can definitely put that into hyperspeed. Don't count on any one relationship. There can be delays in publishing, uh, but tap into existing audiences with publisher outreach. Yeah, and PR, publisher outreach, it takes time. So it's yep. not it's not something that with an ad campaign, we can turn it on in a matter of a day or two max once we have all the assets and everything ready to go. 
with publisher outreach, it is a longer game because we're working with editors and there's a lot of pay to play in that, right? It's not all organic and earned. So if you are going to do publisher outreach, outreach, which we do recommend, because if you can get some wins there, it can kind of change the game for you, especially if you're working with a large publisher, uh, you have to be prepared for a longer engagement and really kind of buckle down and, and not look for the overnight success. This, this, you might see something in two, three, four months out but those wins could be drastic and a real game changer for your campaign. You used to call it uh, PR seeding, publisher uh, pre-activations. You want to get those conversations started early. Yes, absolutely. Now, I feel like every time I look at YouTube, there's a new chat GPT, AI video, how to create your business in 2023. We're, of course, uh, getting asked about the creation of, of articles, social posts, ads, <laughs> business plans, marketing plans, investor pitches with AI. Tim, I know you have a lot to say on this topic. You know, and I would like to say that nobody's an expert. So on YouTube, everybody's positioning themselves as an expert. I say proceed with caution. Uh, it's new. This is new territory for everybody. Uh, it's, it's kind of like when, you know, cryptocurrency first started making waves and everyone was claiming they're an expert. You're like, it's, it's simply too new to be an expert. So what do I think about AI? I think any leverage you can have, anything to give you a leg up, um, anything to help you move faster is a good thing. And if it can, and if it's adding value and let's say what would normally take you a series of hours can now take you a series of minutes and it's as good as it would have been. If you took that few hours, why not, right? Time is currency. So especially in these campaigns, most of these crowdfund campaigns are short term, 90 days, maybe a little longer, but you're getting in and out quickly. And I think leveraging AI can help you move faster. Uh, and for that reason alone, if it's adding value and it's allowing you to move faster, then, then why not? Why, why not move faster versus slower? No, we want to we want to do things the hard way. We want to do things the slow way. And that's not what people are saying these days, right? We want to be on cutting edge. And most of the companies that we work with are cutting edge. So welcome to 23 and beyond. Is AI going away? No, they have self-driving cars in San Francisco. It's, it's coming for all of us. Uh, so our job is to learn how to adapt and adopt in a responsible way. How to use it whether versus whether to use it or not. Couldn't agree more. We've been using AI in advertising since 2014. There were programmatic real-time bidding platforms that used AI to sort users across millions of lines of different data. I could tell you about 50 targeting filters. It, it would judge by millions. So we've been comfortable with this. We work with Rad AI on influencer marketing and some AI social listening tools there, various other platforms as well. Sometimes having something completed is better than having it perfect. And it's a saying because many times if you're only doing it, if it's perfect, it doesn't get out. There's a time clock for these investor marketing campaigns. There's a time clock for your 2023 marketing campaigns, regardless of what they are. Use that time, have it complete. If it's the difference of putting content marketing out or not, use AI to get you there. There's tools that are specific for uh, AI marketing. There's tools that can, can put this together, but it's all about how you ask the machine. It's all about the questions that you're putting in, the specific details about the the presenter and, and who you're presenting to, but, but you can get some, some strong pieces of copy created. Uh, we're using it as a polishing tool. If we put in a line of ad copy and say, are there ways to improve this with a lot more detail and give us a few variants, we, we may be able to test out something alongside ours over time. Perhaps we use it to create, but with far more volume. So an article a day versus an article every couple of weeks. Uh, I still recommend having a human behind the wheel that that is an expert and is able to correct. I've seen errors. I've seen typos. I've seen sentences that don't really read or wouldn't resonate for a specific group that you're reaching out to. And some of uh, the terms that are used in that space to validate. So I would not hand over the keys to AI, but incorporating it into what you do is, is definitely worthwhile if for nothing else than perspective. 
Live events are picking up. They're selling out. There were uh, some slower ones in 2022. Uh, there were market conditions that impact, impacted that that we directly felt at cryptocurrency conferences, even some you know investor focused conferences. Uh, I I personally and I know there's different personas out there love getting out to a lunch meeting. I love getting to to do in person. We're gonna have the whiteboard meeting with the team later today. Uh, there are many that want to interact at conferences, being able to use these to your advantage, putting together a budget, putting together a calendar, putting together results that you're looking to hit. We're not leaving the conference without 20 new contacts a day. And you know, I'm putting this into your expenses. This right. is how we're projecting what it's going to produce and do live uh, digital correspondence while you're there. So I think we need to change the slide here. Um, I'm still on AI, but yes, live events, which is funny. It's the, uh, it's the opposite of AI, I guess you can say. Uh, and it is a slower approach, but this is an opportunity for you to get in face and what we call press flesh, shake hands, make contacts, meet new relationships, build new strategic partnerships, and really show people that you're the real deal. I mean, let's be honest, humans run companies, not AI tools, humans run businesses. So if you need to get physical interaction with, with the community, with other investors, uh, with networking groups, like get out there, be seen, be show that you are the professional. There's a lot to be said to meeting a founder in person and having a quick, you know, eye to eye conversation, maybe sharing a few laughs and saying, you know, that guy's a winner or that gal's a winner. I, I could see them pulling this off. It's hard to do that if all you're ever looking at is a, a pitch deck. So I think the reason for live events and there's more and more coming out here is you just never know who's out there to meet. And it's hard to meet everybody, you know, on, uh, on Instagram. It's just, it, it's hard to know who to prospect on Instagram. Whereas if you're in a physical event for your trade, and you're, let's say, in the apparel business and you go to an apparel trade show and you're there with all these other booths and vendors and thought leaders and publishers and media. Fantastic. That's what you should be doing as a founder all the time. So definitely build out a schedule of live events when you're when you're about to launch your campaign and ask yourself, what are you know two or three live events I could go to to present at, to meet people, make new contacts and potentially source some investors. And make it part of your 2023. Seek it out, as Tim's saying. Uh, it, it is part of the discussions we're hearing from partners, from clients, uh, along with longer ad funnels. So we mentioned some of the obstacles with pixel tracking. It, to me, is more of an opportunity for a more in-depth client uh, brand relationship investor founder relationship so a lead form uh whether it's on facebook or, or linkedin it can be auto filled uh pointing to a piece of content or some type of immediate value uh exclusivity discounts uh education immediate value and, and then having an ongoing conversation showcasing everything you're doing in terms of thought leadership, the live events you just did, the content pieces, have a, a longer, more in-depth, more meaningful relationship with your prospects this year. Yeah, and that's where the content marketing comes into play as well that we talked about earlier. And this is where the advertising comes into play. So we drive traffic into the funnel, it becomes very sticky and we're providing value. So that, that would be the name of the game with longer ad funnels. It's how can we provide even more value to our prospective investors by giving them more opportunities to learn more about us and go deeper into the relationship with us. Like when uh, Gary V says, don't play checkers, play chess. Mm -hmm. Add to conversion may not work as well this year as add to content, to invite, to another content, to, to update uh, and having that longer strategy involved email still top communication channel don't let anything about these other social platforms confuse that estimated that 4.3 billion people used email in 2022 
believe it's over half the planet. I'm told 8 billion. I think that checks out. Emails are still one of the most effective methods to reach your audience. We're generally sending them up for a newsletter that reflects other groups in your space. So for investor marketing, weekly is generally the play. For e-commerce, it could be 3x, could be more. So to do that competitor marketing audit as part of your strategy, sign up for your competitor's email, see what they're getting out. Uh, and then drips, prospective investors, completed investors. We'll see 10 to 30% of retail investors participate multiple times on these campaigns. So don't ignore the completed investors. So Jason, I got a question for you. Uh, yeah. I meet a lot of folks that say, well, I don't have an email list. I'm kind of getting started from scratch. So I understand email is very valuable, but I only have 20 emails. Uh, what do I do? Can you help me? Give up, never use email again. <laughs> option one <laughs> or or, or <laughs> option two, continue to build your email audience. Uh, a lot of hacks towards this. Uh, I've seen founders uh, who could be retired based on age demographics, reaching out to people that they went to college with and looking to bring everyone that they have interacted with, if possible, to their email newsletter system. Uh, there are tools to get more followers constantly on LinkedIn. There are approaches to do the same for email or to take from LinkedIn and move to email, to take from advertising and move to email. We talked about longer drips, going to conferences, not leaving until you get 25, 50 cards per day per rep and building, 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 building. If you get 10 new email contacts a day, uh, imagine you're working every day as a founder, that's 300 new contacts a month. That's 3,600 for the year. So continue to build, continue to build, continue to build. I, I like to paint pictures of five, 10 years out when I talk about email audience size. We work with real estate funds. We work with various types of funds that are telling me their goals for 2025, 2030. They want to be able to have a million investors and send out one new offering and, and quickly get it placed. That, that That's really the mindset that I like to prime founders for in terms of their email audience. Less interested in what you have today, more interested about five, 10, 10 to 10 years down the line. Let's build that out. Now, peer-to-peer -peer marketing is the ultimate marketing. I use, have used this analogy many times on webinars, but if my brother tells me to check something out, I likely will, at least more so than another person, whether that's an investment opportunity, a golf course, a travel destination, a restaurant. Uh, you can be intentional about who repurposes your content. Uh, just stepped out of a workshop I'm doing with an accelerator, and we're talking about social boost pods for their current cohort, even past cohort uh, founders, so that every time they put out a piece of long form content, they get a dozen or more comments. They get dozens of comments, which boost where the content goes into the algorithm. Have your team repost content, have your friends, your family, people who want to see you succeed, people who have an interest in seeing you receive. Their company uh, uh, is more successful based on how much you're growing. Have them reposting what you do. Uh, as well as think about what content you can create that's going to get more of your peers to market what you're doing. Tim, you're a trendy guy. Hey, thanks. What do you <laughs> look at the jacket, the coat, but but obviously for business trends and what we're looking at for any of the number of different uh, industries that we service, the spectrum of different verticals, what are the best ways to stay up on trends and then to incorporate that into a marketing strategy? Yeah, so I'm fortunate because I have twins that are about to be 16 tomorrow. So uh, if I need trends, I asked them, hey, what's cool? What's what's hip? Uh, we used to say it in our day. <laughs> uh, we also have a marketing agency with a lot of cool young folk. So if you ever join one of our DNA meetings, I'm always asking our team, hey, you guys are, you got me by 20 years. What do you find cool and interesting, right? 
I know what I find cool and interesting in a business context. And I think I'm cool, but really, let's be honest, uh, uh, some of our younger team members are in it day to day on social media, way more than I'm on social media, clicking on things that I probably would never click on, following hashtags that I'm probably unaware of, watching shows that are off my radar, right? So I would say get perspective from a younger audience that is a lot more savvy than you are when it comes to the tech stuff. Most of the founders that we know aren't in their early 20s, just statistically, most aren't. So why not, you know, kind of poke the box a little bit with, with uh, teens and tweens and young 20 somethings. And then obviously you can do all your research and hashtag research and, you know, you should be up on trends all the time. So I feel like I try to do everything I can in my power to stay as much up on trends as possible, but you know, I'm not a huge pop culture guy. So I have pop culture people in my network that love everything pop culture. I'm looking at Homer Simpson, but if you ask a, you know, a 20 year old, they may not know who Homer Simpson is um, or even Michael Jordan. They may not even know Michael Jordan. They'll, they'll know Drake, but you know, Drake, he's not a young man either. So there's probably someone who's gotten by a decade that is the new hot thing that's off our radar. So if you want to tap into those trends, I would say tap into the youth because the youth historically are always on the cutting edge. And we all consider ourselves youthful uh, in some regard. Uh, we've had clients, uh, what are some good examples? Some of the automotive companies, uh, Jaguar, they put people 10 to 20 years younger than their average consumer in the advertisements because their audience sees themselves at that age. Uh, there are some uh, companies that target women in their 40s that want their daughters to like a brand and then have their daughters tell them that it's cool. And be, because of that, the, the company spikes in sales for, for women in those demographics. Uh, I don't know if I want to live in a world without Michael Jordan and or Homer Simpson awareness, I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, being able to play on youth trends really works. Uh, uh, my, my fiance is a lawyer. We share lawyer memes back and forth. One of the most prestigious jobs, sharing memes all day. Investor pages doing the same. These are some top meme pages. Uh, I shouldn't say pages, meme images, templates, if you will, uh, on this page to be able to reference this can see a, a, an improvement in click-through rate, even conversion rate. Uh, or brand perception, it, it is something that you can consider for your campaigns. Uh, and just having a pulse, whether you use it or not, it is very important. Well, and, um, and, and yeah. let me have one thing, which, which is when you would, are getting with the trend, like for example, Twitter has their, you know, their trending, their trending hashtags, and finding ways to incorporate into things that are trending will just move you faster and get more awareness, more eyeballs. So again, that goes back to the AI thing. If we can move faster and have a little leverage working in our favor, let's do that. Because these uh, efforts of marketing campaign, you know, they're an uphill battle a lot of times. It's not easy and it's not for the faint of heart. So we're always looking for tools and techniques and strategies that will help us move quicker, more efficiently and, and leapfrog uh, without as much effort. Exactly. We have Instagram uh, threads. We have photo albums internally where we share screenshots of ads that we've seen, uh, content that is trending. We want to be able to pick up on trends within a 24 hour window. Uh, and some of the content around the World Cup, some of the content around many current events in 2022, there's a short window on when you can use it. Meanwhile, we've seen incorporation of that content. I don't want to say regardless of the vertical, but across a wide range of different industries uh, for investor marketing, then show lifts in performance, not just click through rates. If you heard my comment earlier. So at any time, you can be looking at top trends, top trending content. Tim was pointing out on some specific social platforms and, and look to have that integrated and things are moving faster than ever. So you want to hop on it when you see it. We saw some historical ones here, but you want to move quickly. Creative refresh optimization. We we're talking with our head of content marketing about what to do for 2023 and revisit your brand, revisit your offering, revisit your funnel. Are you competing in a 2023, 2024 marketplace? 
Uh, d- does your brand ha- have areas that can use a little bit of a facelift? Do you want to look at a full creative refresh? Do you want to test it out uh, with an ad, with an email, one of the channels that we looked out f- before without going fully into it are questions that you want to be asking yourself this year. Yeah, and there's a lot of great tools out there like Canva, uh, Unsplash. It, there's really little excuse to have an old looking brand because there's just simply so many tools out there. You can get platforms like Wix that have really good templates and even WordPress and Squarespace. So, you know, you kind of got to drop the ego and not be so in love and get some third party perspective on, on the brand and then just adopt quickly and move on. There's, there's really no excuse to have a really old, outdated looking website these days. And great mile markers, such as the beginning of the year to do it, even AI tools to be able to support you with it. Social listening, be aware of what your competitors are doing for marketing on an ongoing basis. Examine their emails, their ads, look at how they're writing about themselves, who's writing about them. Don't put yourself into a silo. Look at what else is happening in the race per this picture to determine where you're going to put your next efforts. It makes me think you and I should put on some suits and go run around a track. Um, Yeah. One last thing just to add on. I I would do that. One last thing to add on the social listening is that is probably something you should do before you even launch your campaign and definitely do it while you're in motion with your campaign. But as much social listening as as you can do before, as you're planning your campaign, just to see what's getting a response. If you see that someone's getting a great response on webinars in your industry, why is that? And should you adopt it? Or is there, posting a certain hashtag, but what, what can we learn there? So it's really pulling out the magnifying glass and the inspector gadget hat and, and going deep. I said inspector gadget. There's only a few people that know what that is. <laughs> it's the name of a, a lag wagon song. Only a few people who know what that oh. is. But uh, yes, success leaves clues, as Tony Robbins would say. I hope more than a few people know who he is, uh, but but you know, model it off of that. Like you said, don't let your ego get you in the way of any of these decisions. Uh, know what's going on, going on out there. Put it into your calendar. I'm big on systems, Tim. I know you even more uh, so on sta- standard operating procedures. Put it in your calendar. Uh, we'll talk about a platform that we have into our calendar for social listening every Monday, uh, but, but ha- have it be a thing that you've planned on, not hope to get to here and there. Uh, You don't want it living up here. You can have an investor survey if your campaign's working, if your campaign's not working, figure out why. Don't work off assumption, work off the data, have a survey going, ask the right questions that are going to give you the right information that then allow you to act. Actionable insights, something I say a lot, Get direct feedback from those you're actually pitching. Optimize your strategy off it. Close the gaps. Don't just tell yourself a channel doesn't work. Ask investors why they didn't move forward on it. And you can you can look to improve. Make it be a productive activity. Third-party outreach. Tim, what's the deal with all these logos over here? Why is it more important if if they say something uh, than a brand themselves? And what are the best ways to make that happen? Yeah, social proof. So imagine Yahoo Finance redistributed your press release and you're able to share that with prospective investors. Imagine you had an article about the proprietary nature of your business and why this is going to change the industry. And that was listed on Forbes. It's just social proof. We see it all the time. Uh, We're humans, right? We like trust factors. So if you're getting validated by any of these household names, it just goes a long way to saying this is the stamp of approval. And again, I mentioned a lot of this. There is a lot of pay to play. It's not all earned. There's earned and paid. And we know a lot of those strategies. So if you're watching this and you have any interest in working with any of these publishers and any of the hundreds, if not thousands of publishers out there that have household names, uh, we can work with you on on mapping out the right strategy on how to get there. We can talk about budget. We can talk about timing. We can talk about storyline. Uh, that's really where we can shine and, and support someone who's interested in getting into the media. Absolutely. 
Many of these groups have paid programs. And if you do nothing else, then mention on your weekly email or in one of your ads or other pieces of content, other pieces of paid marketing that we've mentioned thus far in, uh, you know, we were in Yahoo Finance last week. Look at what we do with Benzinga, who has direct response type programs. Check out uh, the local NBC news station that covered us or, or you know, we got into syndication with our press release. It, it adds to that investor story. It's all about that third party validation, all about that social proof. Uh, this can occur with direct outreach. We also see direct outreach to investors uh, as a very valuable thing. 20% uh, acceptance rates of invitations on LinkedIn, 20% or higher response rates, e even to call scheduling, depending on what you're doing uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, these are things that are available to you at no cost uh, on these platforms. Yeah, we've been testing out a lot of outreach tools. I mean, we were early on testing LinkedIn outreach tools. Um, I would say at this point, we've probably tested everything out there that there is to be tested. And we know what kind of algorithms and response rates we should be looking for, um, how many conversations on average you should be getting into with investors per month. I mean, we, we have some pretty good stats there, but it is you don't even need to use a tool. It's something you can just do on your own. So if you're trying to raise your money, uh, you know, carve out an hour jump into those platforms and be a real human. Hi, I noticed you're listed as an investor here on LinkedIn that, and I looked at your profile and you invest in my industry. I'm Tim. I have something really cool. I've worked really hard, put my blood, sweat, and tears into it. I would love nothing more than two minutes to give you a two minute pitch. Can you give me two minutes? Right. And then do that 100 times. You will get people to respond and say two minutes. Sure. I'd love to hear a two minute pitch. And you go, right. You can do that on Facebook and on Instagram and just source people and go for it. And as many times as we say it, it's still not incorporated into the majority of strategies. You could do this for people in your city, in your town. that You could physically meet with. Pro proximity is power. They're more likely to respond. You can sort using some different tools by people who've posted or engaged on LinkedIn in the past 30 days. So they're more likely to respond. It could be very, very specific. We've built some of our strategic partnerships using this approach. I think every founder should be doing it on an ongoing basis towards strategic partnerships, if not investors directly. LinkedIn outreach, uh, email outreach as a whole, an underrated. <clears throat> Being able to talk about your momentum on your portal, being able to talk about your momentum on your self-published page, using that as the anchor, as the SEC points to, for your investment opportunity, for your content, for your updates, is a must. Uh, some of the portals allow for following of a deal, even if an investor doesn't participate. Some of them will have an email go out automatically when you do an update. Some will choose from the top updates of the week to determine who they feature in their email newsletters. Do not overlook this. Uh, once a week, in most cases, it is more than sufficient. We've seen groups do it daily, uh, but make sure you're getting out there, especially more than your competitors. I R. What are the best approaches for 2023 for IR, Tim? I think the best approach for 2023 is the approach that's been there since day one, from the first time somebody took a dollar from someone else uh, to invest into their business. Why not build a relationship with your investors? The name of the game in business and in life is relationships, strong relationships. Every dollar is one vote of trust into your company. And you are now the fiduciary of that trust. It is your responsibility to ensure that you are delivering on that trust. So stay in communication with your investors. It doesn't mean you have to have one-to-one -one conversation with a thousand people, but maybe you run a newsletter, maybe you run a blog, maybe it's just investor-only invites, but you're constantly making further advocates of your investors. Let's be honest. If someone put a thousand dollars in, they can probably put 1500 bucks. If they put 1500 bucks, they might be able to put in $15,000 on the next race. If they put in 15,000 when you go series B or you go public, or whatever, they're gonna ride with you. And you were saying this earlier, it's that peer-to-peer uh, -peer marketing where if your brother said, hey, I just invested into this really cool snowboard company. They just opened up this offering. I know you like snowboarding too. Why don't we, why don't we go in, put our money in? 
right? And they're going to have some additional benefit. We get to go ski or snowboard with them on the private mountain or whatever. Awesome, right? And, and now we're part of a newsletter that's just to us. We start to feel special about it. We're telling our other friends in the community. If you're not doing any investor relations, what does that say about you? What does that say about your company? It means that you're just transactional in nature and you really don't care about me. Exactly. And it's all in the follow-up. We see those increased values happen all the time. Uh, you could have creatives built just for uh, the investors who have voiced an interest in your company, the completed investors. Video, video, video is what our creative team wants to emphasize here in 2023. Add subtitles, text overlays, icons, sounds, et cetera. Short attention grabbing content, feature video highlight at the start, engaging thumbnails. You could spend an hour on YouTube and take notes from the top uh, publishers there, the top influencers, all about the thumbnail and the headline. You can use that for your social content and look to step it up here in 2023. You do not want to have the 2022 feel on your creative. So have that social listening. You use all of this um, towards getting that higher click-through rate, that higher conversion rate, that stronger relationship, as Tim's saying, with your 2023 creatives. Don't be afraid to test new channels. Facebook and Google are the most popular channels. Over a billion daily active users on Facebook. Uh, Google still top site. Uh, but alternate platforms such as TikTok, which has stronger time spent metrics than Google, uh, Reddit, and Taboola have shown to increase on campaigns. Can try SMS text marketing as well too. Go in with the plan. Look at what you're going to measure. Look what you're going to run for creative. Have a long enough uh, timeline to be able to produce results and not cut things off too early are our recommendations on channels. <clears throat> what about educational content? Yeah, so education, this is educational content. So let's keep it real simple. Most people have Zoom on their desktop and you can jump on a call with your, let's say founding partners or your vendors or strategic partners or lead investors. You can create content constantly about the value proposition that you're providing to the world. Uh, with your with your business. So businesses are built on problem solution. The more you can educate others on the solution to, to the problem that you're fixing, the better. And that can take a lot of forms. So it could look like a, you know, a short form post on Twitter. And it can also be something that's a long form, like a podcast or a webinar or anything. You get to pick the platform. That's the fun part about it. But I would say as a founder who's looking to do an early stage raise, you are an educator. You must consider yourself an educator. So I've now donned you an educator. I've waved my magic wand and all founders that are out there listening to this, you are now educators. So what would an educator do? Educators educate. Singers sing, writers write, right? Artists paint, you're an educator. So get out there and start educating everybody about your product. You're the number one advocate of your business. Great. Great way to look at that. Salesmen sell. People don't want to be sold. They want to be educated. And it's immediate value. So great way to define that there. And don't forget to test, optimize, scale. The name of my podcast, you can see it in the top slide, the top of the slide here, summarizing what we do into three words. It's test, optimize, and scale. Don't be discouraged by low metrics. Use them as learning opportunities and insights to optimize everything that you're doing from audience to messaging to funnel. Make sure you're getting conclusive enough data to test. Don't shut things off too early. Everyone's seen that image with the miner with the pickaxe and he's turning around and the diamonds are right after that next stage of the wall. Make sure you're getting conclusive enough sample sizes. Uh, but, but from there, optimize, look to improve it, then optimize towards what is working and then look for opportunities to scale. The groups that are at the top of the space are the ones that are scaling. Uh, and even with moderate return levels, scale, lean into it, see a spike, see much stronger return levels, continue to scale, 
so on and so forth, that that is really the school of thought that we promote. We're getting to the final three here. Tim, I'm going to let you tackle this one and uh, I'll hop into the next two here. Yeah, uh, I think one of the easiest things you can do is have a content calendar. Uh, and a content calendar will allow you to be aware of what's coming up as events are happening. So the, the easy ones are holiday, uh, any major event that is recurring. And then you, know, you have to be careful on what your position and stance on uh, public affairs and, and things that are happening globally. And you know that's for you to determine your voice on that. Uh, political issues and things of that nature. It, depending on your industry and depending on your investors, they may be looking to you to be a voice of certain issues. Um, so you have to, you know, tread lightly and determine how you want to communicate that. But when it comes to just general uh, events that are popping up on an annual basis or things that are happening in your community, uh, there's tons of event calendars out there too to tap into. So just look at calendars and just be aware of what's happening. I like this, you know, don't be tone deaf show that you're part of the community. And it gives you something to talk about. If you're running the same ads throughout the entirety of your campaign, it will begin to feel stale. <clears throat> you want to talk about your thought leadership, also want to play into current events. It doesn't have to just be calendar holidays. If you're in sports, it could be the NBA finals. It can be what's coming up in, in any of the different areas that you touch have some versatility. I had mentioned earlier for the social listening, we have a schedule. Every Monday morning, we look at King's Crowd. King's Crowd shows us the analytics for every live Reg CF campaign. Uh, also gives us a good amount of data on Reg A plus campaigns uh, and then some Reg D, but uh, really for CF and A plus. There's a Saturday report that allows us to look at the top 10 campaigns. We're able to look at what's moving the most for the month. We look at the top 10, the top 2%, the top 10%, the top 20%, the top 50%, uh, the bottom 50% are not moving. And it's tough to find marketing that is live for that bottom 50%. Uh, even the top 10% are, are marginally moving. Uh, you want to be doing what the top groups are. If we didn't put it into the calendar, maybe once a month, maybe some months we miss it. Uh, would be our narrative towards how often we do it. Instead, every Monday morning, as a team, we are going through this. It shapes what we're doing for the week on our marketing campaigns. It gives us context for our conversations with clients. It allows us to then figure out where we want to do a deeper dive and do another competitor marketing audit of one of the top issuers uh, or a new issuer that's entered the space. Again, you want to be able to see where your target audiences are going where they're physically moving today. And what, once you have all this set up, and I talked about the 2022 notes, do, do not be scared. Be assertive. <clears throat> if your metrics are trending up, uh, don't be afraid to scale. Again, that's, that's what I've seen with founders. The most active founders have the most successful campaigns. The most active fan, founders lean into things when they're seeing a return regardless of the level. And it, it tends to pan out for them because they're getting more traffic. They're getting more people involved. Scaling your marketing opens up your company to more opportunities, getting more eyes, more, more large scale investors. Don't think, should I market this year? Should I raise capital this year? As much as how am I going to use these other 22 points to build that up? Get in contact with us. We'll give you our insights. Open to a warm marketing discussion, a, a digital coffee, if you will, at any point. Tim, how do people get in contact with you if they wanted to get, continue the discussion? And, yeah. and how do you feel about being scared? Huh. Uh, I, I agree with the uh, re, uh, being assertive bit. I like to say be relentless. Yes. Uh, massive action. Take massive action all the time. Um, be the last man standing, if, if you will. If you want to get in contact with me, it's tmartinez at digitalnicheagency.com. Uh, that's my email. Always happy to jump on a call and tell you what I know um, and, you know, try to get you over the hump, over the hurdle and give you some real valuable insights on how do you make a campaign successful. Awesome. Awesome. And highly encouraged that you do build your network, build this out. A lot of different introductions and connections that could come from that. 
Uh, I see different questions here on, on pricing, on packages. We like to be easy to work with. We do have programs for everything that we're talking about here. Get in contact with us. If nothing else, we'll give you some insights uh, from live campaigns that may have to remove some names, but be able to tell you what we see working and not working. Test, optimize, and scale. Have a big 2023. Don't just get by. Hit and surpass those milestones for the year that you put into your 2023 plans. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Tim, this has been a blast. Glad we were able to get on here. And uh, let's keep the conversations. Let's keep the marketing going. Do it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.